Howdy and welcome to the 10-week Bible study. This is week five, day two of our study of Nehemiah. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Nehemiah 7, 43 through 73. Welcome back to the 10-week Bible study. Would you join me as we pray before we start today? Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us? Fill our hearts with the knowledge of you today, God. Fascinate us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. I'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Nehemiah 7, starting in verse 43. The Levites, the descendants of Jeshua through Cadmiel through the line of Hodaviah, 74. The musicians, the descendants of Asaph, 148. I want to pause right there. Now, this is important. This is going to come back into our storyline here. The the musicians and the gatekeepers and these people, uh, The I don't believe Ezra. Ezra didn't really list people out in quite the same way. The, the, the list of people between Ezra and here, they're very similar. There's some very similar numbers, but there's also some differences. Uh, there's more similarities than there are differences, but I want to point this out because this is going to come back in in, in a really important way later on in the book. In, in chapter 12, we're going to have to look uh, very carefully at the list of these names right here and their importance for what Nehemiah is going to set up and reconstitute that hasn't happened in Jerusalem for centuries at this point. But again, we'll come back to that when we get to uh, chapter 12, and, and we'll touch on it a little bit here and there. But notice these musicians and gatekeepers and these people. Verse 45. The gatekeepers, the descendants of Shalom, Ater, Talamon, Akab, Hatita, and Shobai, 138. The temple servants, the descendants of Ziha, Hasufa, Taboeth, Kiros, Saya, Padon, Libana, Hagaba, Shalmai, Hanan, Gidel, Gahar, Reaya, Rezin, Nikoda, Gizam, Uza, Pasaya, Bisai, Munim, Nefusim, Bakbuk, Hakufa, Harher, Bazlith, Mahida, Harsha, Barkos, Sisera, Tima, Naziah, and Hatifa. The descendants of the servants of Solomon, the descendants of Sotai, Sophereth, Perida, Jela, Darkon, Gidel, Shephatiah, Hatil, Pokereth, Hazabaim, and Amon. I mean, imagine having your name be Pokereth, Hazabaim. Uh, how often does your mother have to call your name? It's almost like this guy's mother called his middle name so much it eventually just stuck and everyone called him Pokereth has a bane. Now there's meaning behind all of this, but I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but it does make you wonder about those kind of things. And again, if this is your first time joining me on the podcast, the reason I'm reading this is you may look at this and say, this has no application to my life whatsoever, but it matters to God. It mattered to God enough to put it in here. And Jesus was very clear. He said, not one jot or tittle. It's a, a, basically the Hebrew version of a dotting of an I or a crossing of a T. Not a, a dot of an I or a cross of a T in the law of all of the Old Testament will pass away. Jesus didn't come to, to abolish it, but to fulfill it. So for all eternity, he said, none of this will pass away. This is important to God for all eternity. And if it's important to God, we want to know why. Verse 60. The temple servants and the descendants of the servants of Solomon, 392. The following came up from the towns of Telmela, Telharsha, Kirub, Adon, and Immer, but they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. The descendants of Deliah, Tobiah, and Nakoda, 642. And the descendants of the priests. Well, let me pause there. Ezra gave us a similar accounting of people that could not show any family lineage. And this is not as important for the other tribes, but for the Levites and the people that are going to be touching the sacred things. The Lord required, he absolutely required that they be from the appropriate lineage, either to be the pri a priest or a Levite. And without that Without that family tree, without proof of that, Nehemiah and Ezra both said, okay, well, you get to be counted in this number, but you can't touch any of the sacred things. You can't participate in those priestly duties. I'm sure they found other things for them, but they couldn't do the sacred priestly duties because they 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 couldn't know for sure if they were from the, the correct line. And they're being very precise with this, very exact with this, because it mattered to God, so they want it to matter to them. All right, continuing on, verse 63. Uh, from among the priests, the descendants of 
Hoba, Hobiah, Hakos, and Barzillai, a man who had married a daughter of Barzillai the Gileadite and was called by that name. If you remember uh, studying in the books of Samuel, especially 2 Samuel, where David has a friend named, or a guy that helps him named Barzillai. This Barzillai was named after in honor of that original Barzillai during the time of David. I mean, we're centuries removed here, but he has that name to as a remembrance of Barzillai the Gileadite. Verse 64. These searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor, therefore, ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there should be a priest ministering with the Urim and Thummim. The whole company numbered 42,360, besides their 7,337 male and female slaves, and they also had 245 male and female singers. There were 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. Um, I want to point out here that they have personal singers is what they're talking about. They're listing the, the servants and the singers. These are not the singers that we're going to read about later in the book. These are people who wealthy people have hired. We talked about this in the book of Ezra. It may even be the same accounting from the book of Ezra. It's, it's the people who were paid to sing and make music for their wealthy benefactors or whatever they were. I mean, back then there was no, there was no streaming music. There were no CDs. There weren't even eight tracks. If you wanted music, if you wanted someone to sit and make music for you in your, your house, you had to pay someone to do it. And there are wealthy people in this company who actually had enough money to full time hire musicians to come and play for them. Continuing on verse 70, some of the heads of the families contributed to the work. The governor gave to the treasury a thousand derricks of gold, 50 bowls, and 530 garments for the priests. So Nehemiah is kind of soft slipping it in there. He doesn't say, I gave. A lot of this other stuff, it seems like it's a little bit more first person at times. But here, Nehemiah is speaking at least of himself, or he's having written about himself in the third person, the governor. Verse 71. Some of the heads of the families gave to the treasury for the work. 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,200 minas of silver. The total given by the rest of the people was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 garments for the priests. This is a lot of money. This is a whole heck of a lot of money that's been given over to you know all, all of this. And so this is a, a massive offering. This is a big occasion that's going on. Verse 73. The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the temple servants, along with certain of the people and the rest of the Israelites, settled in their own towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, now we're going to have a strange pause there because next we start into chapter 8. And this is one of those oddball places where, at least in the NIV, it's kept a more traditional way of, of dividing up the chapters. This is one of those places where it seems like when the people about a thousand years, less than a thousand years ago, came up with the chapters, the breakdowns, maybe they they got something a little off here. It's just a little strange because it seems like this should start chapter eight as opposed to being the last verse in chapter seven. I think sometimes it, it if if you have never read the Bible without chapters and verses, I encourage you to go out and buy a set of Bibles. Very often they're printed almost in paperback versions, novel sets. I actually have some on hand. Um, they're called the Immerse Bible. If you look for Immerse Bible uh, on Google, you will come up with, uh, you, you'll pretty quick in the search, you'll find the Immerse Bible. And it's a, it's a volume of books actually that make up the Bible. And, and basically what they've done is they've just removed the chapter and verses from the Bible. And the chapters and verses were not original to the text of the Bible. The only thing that is broken up in that way is the book of Psalms. That was originally broken up into 150 Psalms, just like we have it today. Uh, but even still, there were no verse numbers in, in the Psalms. So the chapters and verse numbers were added much later, around 1100 AD and then 1340. 100 AD, 1400 AD, somewhere in there. I think the the final ver version of the verse numbers that we have is somewhere in the 1400s. 
and so those things came much later. Now I, I I'm amazed by those. I think they're they can be very useful. I think the Lord even uses those numbers at times. The Lord has used those verse numbers in my life and my family's life at times in very powerful ways. So the Lord can use those things. So I don't want to discount and say that the, the chapters and verses just shouldn't be there because I've seen the Lord do amazing poetic things with those. But when it comes to reading scripture, just getting it in you. Uh, They've done study after study where they've shown that because we have chapters and verse numbers, the Bible actually looks like a reference book, and a reference book is like a dictionary, a thesaurus. Nobody reads a dictionary unless you're super bored, but nobody reads a dictionary. You, You have it as a reference book because you refer to it when you need it. And what they've found is people treat the Bible in the exact same way. They will pick it up and refer to it when they feel like they need it, but they won't read it. And so these books, these books, uh, uh, you know, these, these versions of the Bible, like the Immersed Bible, there's the uh, Bibliotheca is another one that was, was created um, to where they strip the, the chapter and verse numbers because it makes it more readable. And what they found is you end up reading when you use one of these kinds of Bibles that has the chapters and verses stripped from it, it actually looks more like a novel. When you look at the book, on printed paper, it looks like a novel and it actually reads more like a novel. You pick it up and you end up reading somewhere between three and five times more Bible every time you sit down with it than if it had the chapters and verse numbers, something very simple. But, uh, you know, when, when those things are taken away, you end up reading more. And so that's where, you know, these kind of chapter, uh, discrepancies where that comes in. It doesn't matter if you're reading a Bible like that. And I thought I would take this opportunity to recommend that you read a Bible like that. If you are, if you listen to the Bible as you drive, then that's not going to matter as much. Most of the time when you listen to the Bible, they're not announcing the verse numbers. They will announce the chapter numbers, but most of the time they don't announce the verse numbers anyway. But if you read the Bible, if you read a paper version of the Bible, then I highly encourage you to get that. I highly encourage everybody to read a paper version of the Bible. But if you if you listen to it, that's acceptable, too. Um, But I, I would highly recommend the Immerse Bible or other versions like it where they have removed. All they've done is just remove the chapter and verses from it, and it makes it so much more readable. Okay. That was a long bunny trail from this one little oddball here that we have. And again, this oddball deal where chapters 7 and 8 have this weird break. This is not part of the original text. This is something that was done much, much later. And not even every translation, English translation of the Bible, has the the break between 7 and 8 in exactly the same place. All right, so for the 10-week Bible study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the 10-Week Bible Study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing you're always hearing people talk about? It really helps other people find out about the show, and my heart is for people to fall in love with God's Word. Thank you. Thank you.